All right, and we are joined by Nick Lakata, who's running uh, for re-election to council position six. So go ahead with the two-minute introduction. Right. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the executive board and the ACD interview committee for uh, the 36th District Democrats for having me here. Um, I am running for another term on the Seattle City Council. The reason I want to run and be on the City Council is because I want to finish a number of things that have been done. And I want to continue to work to make Seattle, above all, a place that's affordable for people who I see currently are being uh, forced to move outside the city because they're not kind of, they cannot find affordable housing, they cannot uh, receive the kind of uh, services they would expect the city to provide. And most recently, um, I've worked on trying to push the council to adopt a uh, very, I would say, progressive incentive zoning legislation so that when there's development in the city, a certain percentage of the housing has to be set aside as affordable housing. Most other cities in our size do that. Seattle has fallen way behind other cities, and I consider that critical. I also want to follow through uh, on legislation I'm currently designing to have, uh, have our local banks be more accountable to their investments in the city. I've worked with the uh, executive department on our last uh, contract we have with the major bank that's uh, handled our money to have them graded periodically. Uh, and I would like to see that extended to other areas as well. Overall, I think that uh, the city council has to consider the future of Seattle in a social justice prism, which means that we need to look at um, who's living here, who's working here, and making sure that the quality of life does not suffer as we have a city that accommodates more and more people. Great, thank you. Now we have um, five prepared questions that we're asking all city council candidates. Two minutes uh, answers to each of these, and I think we'll start with them. Sure. What is your strategy for implementing, leveraging, and perhaps improving the incentive zoning program to create diverse neighborhoods and assure affordable housing? Oh, great. Yeah. 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 I was talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, literally my strategy is to uh, work with key constituent groups uh, like the unions, like the nonprofit housing developers, and actually some of the for-profit developers to focus on the mayor's uh, task force that he created and also uh, working with the consultants the city council hired. My goal is that uh, as a requirement for a developer to use an upzone in any area in the city, they have to provide a minimum of 10% of the housing units in that locale on the site be affordable at 60% of AMI, average median income, and the other half at 80% average median income. Right now, uh, what the city council is about to pass, which was better than what the mayor proposed, is roughly 5% of the uh, residential area for affordable housing, and they're using only at 80%. So we need to double the amount to 10% for what we call performance or on-site development, and we also need to make sure that it's at 60 and 80%. If we uh, ask developers just to go for 80% of AMI, they're only providing housing at that margin. So to get housing for those that are at 60%, you have to say up to 60%. Um, if we look at uh, other cities that have uh, more responsible uh, incentive zoning, inclusionary zoning, they have a higher percentage of people who live and work in the city. Right now, we have 37% of the people who work in the city, live in the city. I believe our goal should be 50%, I think we can reach that objective by uh, having a more uh, robust uh, incentive zone program. Thanks, uh, Sarah, number two. In your view, what is the city's role in ensuring assuring equal education to all and achievement opportunity in Seattle public schools? I think one of the things that we need to do is when we look at the uh, that was an education levy, we need to make sure that it's being uh, used in those schools that have uh, the, I would say, either the highest failure rate or the rate where uh, students have dropped out. Um, there is a, there has been a trend 
where schools in the south end now are accommodating uh, more poor students, a higher percentage of them are going on uh, having lunches on the federal level. And so uh, what I don't want to see in Seattle is have our city uh, be divided geographically amongst uh, economic and uh, ethnic groups. And I think that if you stop that from happening by having strong schools, so this way families don't move to personal island who have the money, or you don't have families who uh, don't have um, uh, enough money finding that they're cheating um, their own children by not devoting enough time to them. So I think the city needs to work with the school um, district as closely as possible in how we allocate that money. I also uh, am very strong support of having a more um, robust, for lack of a better term, um, arts and cultural activity in the schools. We recently applied for the Wallace Grant. We got the first Wallace Grant in for planning. The second one is on its way in. Uh, a woman named Carrie is who's in charge of the uh, arts uh, development in the school district. I've been working with her personally and other people. Uh, and it's been proven that those youth that are most likely to drop out or end up, in, unfortunately, in the juvenile justice system are best reached to the arts uh, and uh, cultural programs. So I would like to see the city take a, a, a more uh, aggressive stance in uh, working with the school department, school district, to help those programs mature uh, in the schools throughout the district. Clayton, number three. Voters crash the parks and green space is flooding in 2008. Yet we've experienced cutbacks in staffing and facilities since then. When the levy is up for renewal next year, how can it be constructed to ensure voters that their tax dollars will be allocated once? Well, um, we can do two things. One of the things we can do, and actually this is an idea I had, and uh, since I've been on the city council and the parks department adopted it, was that we uh, set up a, a separate fund from the last parks levy, so there would be an uh, opportunity fund, so this way uh, community groups could come and uh, pitch their ideas and we had some money set aside to work with them on those particular neighborhoods that didn't receive funding. Actually, the idea grew out of a, a library uh, bond issue that was passed in, I think, uh, 99 or 2000 when I first got to the council, so we set up an opportunity fund there and we adopted the idea for parks. The other thing we can do is that the levy uh, will allow the funds to be used for uh, maintenance and operations. And in the past, we really haven't been doing that. So I would support taking a, a, some of those funds to assure that we uh, use those funds for uh, operation and maintenance. But ultimately, uh, we have to look to the general fund to make sure that we're not just uh, siphoning off money that was uh, going to uh, those purposes, but they should be in addition to those purposes. Uh, we have a huge park system in, in the city, and uh, if we do not maintain it well, we lose the support of uh, the residents who vote for the park levy. So they have to see that the parks are well maintained. Um, and that means basically uh, putting money forward to uh, work in those areas. Uh, one last point, we have some pretty good programs working with youth and parks in the summers. I'd like to see those be strengthened so this way we can involve more youth uh, and allow them to earn some money at the same time to help all our parks uh, have better maintenance. Thank you. Thanks. There will likely be two types of election reform on the ballot this fall, district elections and public financing and campaigns. Do you support either or both of these and why? Uh, I definitely support the public campaign financing. Uh, I was one of the people who actually, uh, actually uh, talked to my fellow council members. I was able to get Sally Clark, Tom Rasmussen, and Michael Ryan to write a letter to uh, the Ethics and Elections Commission asking them to please come back to us if they done if they did work on this issue back in 2008 and asked them to revisit the issue and come back with a proposal. They just, just came back with a proposal, which I'm glad to see and which I'd like to see put forward right now. Uh, and uh, it will have to be a vote of the public, so I'm very concerned that it'll be something that's uh, received positively by the public. Uh, regarding district elections, uh, historically, I've been supportive of district elections. I think that it really helps people to understand, um, and I think they have a natural inclination that 
there should be someone that represents them geographically. This particular proposal, I have some questions about, but I haven't uh, come out for or against it. One of the concerns I have about it was uh, expressed by um, the uh, Service Employees International Union, the CIU, who did some research and they found that under the current setup, there may be a uh, tendency to not have enough minority representation as one could possibly have the way it's uh, designed. It wasn't done that on purpose. I think they actually used Dr. Morale at the University of Washington, I mean, he's a great geographer, geographer and does a great job. But uh, I think the unintended consequence was to diminish the probability of having adequate minority representation. So uh, I have some serious doubts about that uh, proposal. Dave, number five. Uh, what are your specific recommendations for selecting our new police chief and restoring public confidence in our police department? Well, I think it took a great step forward when uh, we, the council, insisted that uh, Merrick Bob be hired as a monitor. Uh, he just released his first report. I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, he's very straightforward. He understands police departments. He's worked with them for a while. He's well in this area. And uh, he noticed, for instance, that the uh, SPOG, the Police Officers Guild, has not really accepted the uh, mandate uh, of the consent agreement to work with Monitor. And that I think one of the things we need to do is when we bring in the police chief, they have to uh, receive the competence of uh, uh, rank and file of the police department, but they also have to understand that he is the police chief and he is speaking for uh, the city, speaking for the mayor, and the council. And we cannot compromise on uh, having uh, police uh, respect um, our citizens. And I think, unfortunately, there have been too many incidents that have uh, received uh, videotaping of police conducting behavior which it does not build support and respect for the police in the, city, in the city of Seattle. And I think that the response from the management has been too lax. So um, as the uh, search goes on for a police chief, which I think should be delayed until the new mayor comes on board, uh, I think we should involve this uh, Citizens Police Commission uh, to some extent. I'm not sure how, but I think we have a good bunch of people there. And I think uh, above all, we need to find a police chief who understands that he needs to uh, set up a new culture in the police department, one that uh, is built on mutual respect between the police and our citizens. All right, now we'll open it up to follow up questions from anyone on the board. These are one minute answers. So. Um, what is your vision and plan for expanding public transportation options in Seattle, particularly the underserved communities and also just addressing gridlock in general? Right. Uh, well, I was very involved in helping create the pedestrian advisory group. Of course, and that followed the model of a bicycle advisory group. So one of the one of the things I've done is make sure there's representation throughout the whole city on these commissions, the bicycle advisory group as well as the pedestrian bicycle group. And uh, you know, I I believe that the bus system is in some ways the, the spine of our system. Um, I think as we go forward in the future, we probably will need fixed rail because it does provide a uh, attractive option. A lot of people will like fixed rail to walk to buses, but we cannot cut back service from buses as we go forward. Um, and I also believe that we need to pay more attention to uh, the design of our roads, the enforcement. I was a, one of the strong supporters of Royce Reports and Red Light Cameras. I think we need more of those in the city. I think we need to change the culture and expectations of driving so you're not driving, driving as fast as you can, but you're driving as carefully as you can. And I support legislation. Uh, the state legislature will lower the, uh, will give the city the opportunity to lower the uh, residential speeds to 20 miles an hour, which I think would be a step in the right direction. Additional questions? Sorry, Jim. It's more of a style question, and I think this is more about your colleagues than you, but there's sort of, um, when people talk about how a lot of the council just seems very cautious, and uh, oh, it's a great idea, but uh, well, the devil's in the details, and you know, things don't happen very quickly, and 
that we hear sort of you know, your name or maybe Mike O'Brien is sort of the outliers of those who will sort of you know go out on a limb and sort of push things. Do you agree with that assessment? And do you think there's a structural issue, or is it just a coincidence that we have you know both personalities? Or what, what do you think that is? What is the, well, what is the deal with the city council? Yeah, I, I have been a citizen activist throughout the city council for over 30 years, and so it's nothing new. The council as a body tends to be, um, someone said, makes prudent decisions or cautious decisions. Um, the, you know, we're all looking at large, uh, so we're trying to balance a lot of constituencies. So there's a built-in, I would say, conservative sort of approach. Um, and I, I, I think everyone on the council would probably self-describe himself as a liberal Democrat. Um, and I think if you talk about long-range goals, they would all be in agreement with that. So the difference comes in risk-taking. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I have been with people who are willing to take a risk. I think the most recent example is trying to get uh, fixed affordable housing required in South Lake Union. I, I was the one who came up basically embraced the idea to take a bold leap forward. And other council members um, as a whole have said, let's study it some more. The biggest hurdle I think we face in Seattle making progress, quite honestly, is doing too many studies. But at some point, you have to make a decision. You have to decide whether you're going to go ahead or not. And um, that is something that is uh, part of the character of a free elected office. Are you going to elect someone who's willing to take a chance to accomplish something really good and visionary, or do you want to take, uh, get someone in office who's, would I consider to be overly cautious, and as a result, you stretch out for a too long period of trying to, uh, of getting actual things done. Thank you. I've been nursing. Um, what may be a reactionary question for a long time. Which <laughs> 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 is, uh, which is, I hate paying four dollars an hour to park. Uh -huh. um, not just because it dents my lawn, but because it means that I don't get to visit the, the, the Zeitgeist or Cafe Umbria. And so I've, I've given I've given a lot of thought to my absence in Pioneer Square as a symbol of the absence of lots of people. What are your thoughts on that? Am I, am I uh, uh, well? Well, I'll answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, I, I've noticed also a lot of paying so much for parking that I haven't paid for in the past. And I, and I, and I scratch my head, did I come up with this? Um, but, the other side of paying a lot for uh, on-street parking is that the, the private parking is even more so. And one of the formulas we came with, came up with, and actually it was uh, initially articulated by Councilman Burgess, and I think there's some validity to it, is that we want to set the rates in any neighborhood any business area so that there's always some space available to parking if it's too low, all the space that we take up, take it up with people who park there for a long period of time, and it's too high, there'll be too many places to open because no one will want to park there. So as far as I can tell, that seems to be the most rational approach to take. Um, until uh, there's more people building private parking lots, which I'm not encouraging, uh, there's going to be, and until there's better uh, transportation, better bus service, and, and better uh, and a trolley system, uh, there will be people who feel that they have to get there by car, and the demand for parking spaces will be high, and the cost will be high. Uh, and, and the follow-up is that the high rates have had begat a, a culture in, in the organization of the city of zillions of people who are riding bikes around and cars and scooters and segways, uh, nailing people for uh, for uh, you know uh, parking fractions of one kind or another, and and uh, and that in turn becomes symbolic of the city uh, as 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 really really a tough, grubby kind of kind of of uh, automaton. Say, I've 
Yes. This is this is uh, this has been known to general reaction. So. Well, there's, I mean, when you have um, an unregulated density, there is going to be the, the rather rent uh, effect when people start <laughs> yeah, devouring each other but fighting for limited space. Um, you know, I should add on as well, we're, we are making some progress regarding um, uh, vehicle separation, grade separation, I think is critical, particularly in the area of bicycle, bicycle traveling, bicycle tracks. I was able to take a trip to Copenhagen with some council members and, and saw uh, how you can have uh, not traffic congestion, but uh, cars and vehicles having the right of way and bikes having the right of way. So you don't end up with that conflict that I think you're referring to between auto drivers and vehicle drivers and uh, bicyclists. Uh, but that takes uh, infrastructure improvements and that, and that takes investments. And that's what uh, I think we should be investing in. Uh, I think we can be very careful when we start going down the road of making major investments in big projects. We have to ask ourselves how they fit into the larger picture. I have a question. I have a sort of different transit question. Okay. Uh, so, a while back, uh, there's a group that put out a plan it's called the Seattle Subway that sort of advocating for the idea of having a subway in Seattle that could actually get to all these different neighborhoods. And I guess my question is not so much about that plan. It's about, is the idea of such a plan anywhere within the realm of possibility or would you see that as something that is just so fringe it's not even worth talking about? Well, subway, we are literally talking about underground tunneling. Probably some mixes with any subway system. Sure, depending right. on the area. Yeah, Cooper has some elevated. Right, some that's elevated, that's some that's underneath, that's depending that's on what makes the most sense. Well. There's always a question of cost um, and who pays for it. One of the problems is that Seattle, like many other cities, is struggling with trying to build uh, transportation infrastructures in their cities when the federal government has literally withdrawn. So it may sound like you're pushing the buck aside, but the federal government has to make a stronger recognition that our cities need infrastructure improvements. That's one reason I've been very involved in a group called Local Progress, which is Creation nationwide group of progressive local fiscal officials to lobby the state, the, the federal government, the need more money in the city. So the short answer here is it probably is idealistic right now when we get the funding. In the long run, whether it's subterranean, whether it's elevated like the monorail, or whether it's dedicated right of ways for rapid ride bus, any of those options are important to have, and we should have them. But we have to understand how to deal with the, the funding crisis. We just had a, a uh, briefing by Metro regarding buses, and I said, why is it that even if we get the legislation passed, the state legislation, we still are going to meet one third of our growth needs? That's because the MDEP is knocked out in the state. So, on a statewide basis, we need the MDEP back. We have to organize around that as well. So, we're about out of time. I want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. No, I think the the council races and the mayor races always offer an opportunity, I believe, for constituencies and particularly the Democrats to really push a vision for where they want the city to go. And I think that um, at the core of that vision for myself and I think um, the Democrats and a lot of constituents I know is that we need a city that's going to address quality of life issues and look at who is paying and who benefits. And I think that is at the core of good policy. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.